Hi, everybody. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us for the NDBN webinar on diaper banks and using AmeriCorps VISTA resources. We've had a couple of diaper banks that have used the VISTA program successfully, um, and so we're happy to have Ann Osberg um, with the state. She's the state program director for the Corporation of National and Community Services um, in the Connecticut State Office, and they administer the federal program. Um, which has field offices throughout the country. But Anne's going to give us an overview with a particular um, perspective that's going to be useful for diaper banks. So um, we can follow up. Anne already forwarded some information um, that we can distribute after the webinar and through the network. Um, but if you have any questions that are specific to your state or you're looking for follow-up information, you can just email them to me at susan at diaperbanknetwork.org um, or ask or um, if you have any questions and you don't have an audio connection, you can put your questions into the chat box. And we're also recording the webinar. Um, everyone's audio is on mute, but at the end of Anne's presentation, you'll be able to ask questions or make comments. And Anne, I'm going to pass the presentation roll over to you and you can go ahead and get started. Thank you so much, and uh, welcome everyone who's joined today's webinar. As uh, Susan has said, my name is Ann Ostberg. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm the Connecticut Program Director for the Corporation for National and Community Service. We're the federal government agency that administers funding for AmeriCorps programs, including AmeriCorps VISTA. So I thank you for your interest in applying for AmeriCorps VISTA resources. This webinar uh, is targeted to an audience of staff, volunteers, and board members of diaper banks. But the content is really relevant to most nonprofit organizations. So I'm hoping um, that today we will provide you with an overview of the AmeriCorps VISTA program, what it is and what it is not. We'll also talk about the application process and ex expectations of organizations that are selected to host AmeriCorps VISTA members. I have a prepared presentation that will last about 20 minutes, and then I'll open it up for questions and answers. So AmeriCorps VISTA is one of the national service programs of the Corporation for National and Community Service. As I said, we're a federal government agency. VISTA is specifically designed to fight poverty. It was authorized by Congress in 1964 and founded in 1965 as Volunteers in Service to America. In 1993, the program was incorporated into the AmeriCorps network of programs as part of the Corporation for National and Community Service. VISTA supports efforts to alleviate poverty by encouraging individuals to engage in a year of service with a sponsoring organization to create or expand programs designed to bring individuals and communities out of poverty. VISTA members, commonly referred to as VISTAs, range in age and uh, range in a, a broad range of ages, and they come from a diverse racial, geographic, and economic background. Each VISTA makes a year-long, full-time commitment to serve on a specific project with the project sponsor. Organizations that are eligible to apply to be AmeriCorps VISTA sponsors include nonprofit organizations, Indian tribes, state and local governments. Organizations that focus solely on advocacy or lobbying are not eligible. All VISTA projects need to be developed in accordance with all four of the VISTA core principles that are listed on this slide. Anti-poverty, community empowerment, capacity building, and sustainable solutions. So the poverty focus, I'm just going to talk about each of these a little bit. The poverty focus, by law, the purpose of VISTA is to support efforts to fight poverty. The goal of every VISTA project must be to help individuals and communities out of poverty, not simply make poverty more tolerable. The VISTA project should focus on long-term solutions rather than short-term services. Community empowerment. Current uh, and potential new VISTA project sponsors must ensure that their project engages the low-income community residents in planning, developing, implementing, and evaluating the VISTA project. 
The VISTA project must be responsive and relevant to the lives of the community residents, and it should tap into community assets, strengths, and resources. Community participation is a highly effective component of program planning that helps create lasting change in a community. It gives low-income individuals the freedom to speak for themselves in determining the projects that suit their specific needs. Another one of the core principles is capacity building. VISTA projects expand the scale, reach, efficiency, or effectiveness of programs or organizations that fight poverty. Rather than providing direct services to low-income individuals and communities, VISTA strengthen and support organizations by building infrastructure, expanding community partnerships, securing long-term resources, coordinating training, and other capacity building activities. VISTAs should work themselves out of a job and create systems that remain in place long after their year of service ends. In order to focus on capacity building activities, VISTAs do not perform direct service, which prim primarily would include activities that immediately address individual clients' needs. And finally, the core, one of the core principles is sustainable solutions. VISTAs are short-term resources that serve to build the long-term sustainability of anti-poverty programs. VISTA projects should be developed with a goal to phase out the need for VISTA members and maintain the ability of the project to continue without them. So this slide talks a little, little bit about VISTA members, what the terms of service are, and just to give you a little bit of overview of how that all works. So VISTA members are recruited from either the local community or from communities across the country. VISTA members must be at least 18 years old at the beginning of their service year, and they must be U.S. citizens or living in the United States legally as lawful permanent resident aliens. They must attend a required four-day pre-service orientation prior to the start of their service year, and they must serve full-time for 12 months. VISTA members receive a living allowance that varies by county. In New Haven, where the Diaper Bank Network is located, the living allowance for VISTA members is $510 every two weeks before taxes. That figure varies widely across the country, but I just use that as an example to give you a sense of what VISTA members earn for their living allowance. At the end of their year of service, AmeriCorps VISTA members are eligible to receive an end of service award. That end of service award can either be an education award, which currently is at $5,730, or they could choose to receive an end of service stipend of $1,500 that can be spent for any purpose. There are a number of act prohibited activities for AmeriCorps VISTA members. They have some restrictions on their engagement in political and electoral activities, uh, religious instruction during service hours, organizing unions. Uh, they cannot fill staff positions. They cannot manage programs or people. This is just a very brief list of the prohibited activities, but these are the, the primary prohibited activities. So VISTA projects can fall under one of the programming areas established by the Corporation for National and Community Service. We have a variety of programs and all of them need to fit in our programming areas. So the, the programming areas that are relevant to AmeriCorps VISTA are those that are on your screen, education, which includes either K-12 success or post-secondary success, economic opportunity, which might include things like financial literacy, housing or employment, healthy futures, that can either mean food security or access to health care. And VISTA is also interested in supporting projects that support low-income veterans and military families. So the next few slides will go through what organizations might consider when they are uh, determining if they are a good fit for VISTA. So these are questions that I would encourage you to ask uh, within your own organization. Is there a poverty-focused project that your organization would like to start or expand? What are the long-term goals of that project? Are the goals to help move people and communities out of poverty as opposed to just making poverty more tolerable? 
And what populations do the, does the project target? And continu continuing along this vein, other points to consider when you're uh, weighing whether or not you would be a good fit with AmeriCorps VISTA. Uh, you should think about how you would include the local community in the project planning and implementation. How will you measure the project's impact? With what other community groups or organizations will you collaborate? And how many VISTA members can you effectively support and utilize? Remember, these are full-time people that will be serving for one full year, so you need to make sure that there's enough for somebody to do full-time, 35 to 40 hours a week, and for a full 12 months. Next, I'm going to go through the application process. Now, this varies by state, so I'll just share uh, sort of broad information about, about how many of our uh, field offices handle this. But um, you will need to contact your field office in your, for your state to, to learn their timeline and their process. As I said earlier, VISTA resources are funded by the Corporation for National and Community Service, and we receive appropriations from Congress. And then each fall, our headquarters staff in Washington, D.C. advises regional managers how many VISTA positions are available for that particular region. Regional managers then advise field offices how many VISTA positions are available for each state. Some of our field offices then issue a request for concept papers. I do that every year in Connecticut. Um, some states do it every other year, or, or they might do it more often than annually. It just really depends how they need to, what they, uh, the process that they've determined works best for their needs. So again, you'll need to contact the field office serving your state to learn the timeline and process established for that particular field office. And then when you learn what the timeline is, then be sure to submit the concept paper by the deadline. So I'll just add here that uh, the, the email address for contacting the field offices for all of our field offices around the country, it's the two-letter um, two letter code for each state, followed by at, and then cns.gov. So for Connecticut, the email that you can use to contact the Connecticut office where I am housed is C as in cat, T as in Tom, at C as in cat, N as in Nancy, S as in Sally, dot G-O-V. And so that formula would follow for any given state. Wyoming would be Y, uh, W, Y, Texas would be T-X, and so on. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, the concept paper is the first step for an organization that's interested in sponsoring a VISTA project. This is your opportunity to demonstrate that your organization is eligible and capable of sponsoring a strong VISTA project. You also will have the opportunity through your concept paper to demonstrate how the proposed project meets all of the core principles of VISTA programming, and you will have an opportunity to demonstrate how it fits with one or more of the programming focus areas. The concept paper narrative has just four sections. It's really not a very long document. The whole document is maybe five to six pages long. But each section uh, that you'll need to address, uh, the first section is need. And so that's where you'll convey what is the need in the community. The second section, strengthening communities. You'll talk about how your proposed VISTA project will address the need that you listed in that first section. Then you'll also have an opportunity to talk about your organizational capacity. How many staff do you have? You know, what, who do you have in mind for supervising a VISTA or VISTA members? Um, just all that information about your capacity to manage a project. And if for some reason you are applying to have a multi-site VISTA project, uh, then you would have to add uh, what we call an intermediary justification. That would be justifying why you should have a multi-site project, how, project, how you will manage that project. We can talk about that a little bit more in the Q&A section of this presentation.
Successful concept papers demonstrate the anti-poverty focus of the project. They state how VISTAs will build capacity. They involve the low-income community being served in the project development and implementation. They build long-term sustainability. They align with programming goals and programming areas. And they demonstrate the organization's ability to provide adequate project support and member supervision. So once that concept paper is submitted, then the field office for the Corporation for National and Community Service will review it. And they may determine at that point that you are eligible to submit a full application, or they may provide you with a different set of instructions. Uh, some of our field offices have established all of the VISTA resources as multi-site projects. So if you come to them and say, we'd like one VISTA to work with our local diaper bank, they may say, well, then we're going to place you under another multi-site project, so you'll need to contact that project sponsor. We'll make the introductions, and then you'll work with them to incorporate your plan with their multi-site project. And not all concept papers are approved. Uh, this may be due to a number of factors. Those factors could include uh, limited resources. We all have uh, a limit on the number of AmeriCorps VISTA positions that we have available. So sometimes we just have to say no because we don't have enough. There's times when the proposed project does not appear to be a good fit with the VISTA program. And sometimes it may be a case when a field office may already have too many projects in a particular programming area or too many projects in a particular geographical area proposed by the applicant. So um, let's say that in Connecticut, somebody applied and wanted to have uh, a VISTA with a diaper bank, and that VISTA would be placed in Hartford or New Haven, you know, there would be a chance that we could say, well, we already have a lot of VISTA resources in Hartford and New Haven. We're actually looking to develop more VISTA placements in Bridgeport, so we're not going to be able to place any more in Hartford or New Haven. That's just an example, not a, not a real life example, but I wanted to share that. Um, another reason why a concept paper might not be approved is that the organization may fail to adequately demonstrate its ability to manage a VISTA. Or there may be other issues identified by a specific field office about why the concept paper was not approved. The next few slides will walk through the various steps in implementing a VISTA project. Um, once you submit a concept paper, if you are approved to, con to continue, then you would submit uh, further documentation. Uh, but there are many, many steps in implementing a VISTA project, and I think it's best to go into it with your eyes wide open and be aware that this is not just a, submitting a five-page document and then all of a sudden a VISTA shows up at your door. So, some of the steps in implementing a VISTA project include the following. You'll need to sign a memorandum of agreement or understanding that will outline, outline all of the terms and conditions of, of the particular sponsorship that your, your uh, organization is assuming. You will need to pay any costs associated with a multi-site projects or, or a cost share agreement with the Corporation for National and Community Service. So let me talk about that a little bit. The VISTA program places individual VISTAs with sponsoring organizations and covers the costs such as living allowance and the end of service benefit. There is no required cash match for VISTA. However, it is important to note that sponsoring organizations absorb most of the costs related to project supervision and logistical support, which would be a desk for your VISTA, equipment, uh, training, mileage, reimbursement if, if your VISTA is driving around your local community or service area. You'll need to reimburse the VISTA for that mileage. So there is going to be some investment by an organization, and that is really fundamental to the success of the VISTA project, and it provides evidence that there is, and, and you should provide evidence of that support in your concept paper. Now I also use in that second bullet the phrase cost share agreement. Uh, that's a, a unique opportunity through AmeriCorps VISTA. Cost sharing is not required, but it's strongly encouraged. And what does that mean? As a cost share partner, a, a VISTA project sponsor contributes the living allowance of one or more of its VISTAs. 
that could range anywhere from around 11,000 to 17,000 per year. That's for VISTA serving in the state of Connecticut. It's going to be other amounts depending where in the country you are located. So if you feel like you, you know, say you want to, you've applying, you're applying for three or five VISTAs, let's say five, and you say we would like five VISTAs and we are willing to pay the living allowance for one of those VISTAs, so that means we're committing to paying, you know, let's say $12,000. That's, that's an example of a living allowance for one of our VISTA members in, in some areas. So be sure to include that in your concept paper, and that will strengthen your concept paper and make it more likely that it would be approved. The reason being is that our field offices strive to meet a target of at least 20% of all VISTA positions as cost share positions. That allows us to uh, collect money from our projects, uh, to support the VISTAs, and then we will uh, be able to expand the program further because we have a we have a partnership where our project sponsors are helping to fund the the real costs of the VISTAs. So some of the other steps in implementing a VISTA project, as, as shown on this slide, you need to identify a supervisor that will oversee the VISTA member or members. You'll need to prepare a detailed VISTA assignment description, and you are responsible for recruiting the VISTA candidates. You would um, post your position on our website, and candidates would submit their applications online. You would review those, conduct interviews, check references, et cetera. So some additional steps in implementing a VISTA project, uh, you would, uh, should be connecting any, re you should connect any relocating VISTAs to affordable housing in your community. You should provide an on-site orientation and training for the VISTAs. You'll need to provide a desk and appropriate equipment and supplies. Reimburse the VISTA for, for any uh, local transportation and any specialized training that, that the VISTA needs for your particular site. And then, as we said earlier, you've identified a supervisor and then you need to provide that appropriate level of supervision for that VISTA member. In some cases, that might be 10 to 20 percent of somebody's time, just to give you a sense of what appropriate level of supervision is. It really depends on the project and the, and the VISTA member, but 10 to 20 percent is a good ballpark, I think. And then this is the, the final slide of implementing a VISTA project. Uh, you will need to track the VISTA service hours and any leave time that they take. You need to ensure the VISTA does not engage in prohibited activities and is following all program requirements. You'll need to report on the progress toward achieving performance measures that you've established as part of your project. And then Importantly, very importantly, you need to plan for the end of VISTA resources. As we talked earlier, the goal of VISTA is to be a short-term resource, build capacity, and then leave behind sustainable solutions. So from the beginning, it's really wise to plan for the end of VISTA resources. So I have just a Two more slides here. I'd like to just share with you some resources that might be of interest to you. These are other resources available through the Corporation for National and Community Service. While VISTA may be the best fit for your organization, we might have some other programs that could either complement a VISTA project or even be a better fit than a VISTA project. So. Um, just briefly, those are uh, listed on your screen. Retired and Senior Volunteer Program is often known as RSVP. This is a program that can provide short-term episodic volunteers. They're age 55 and older, and they can assist with direct or indirect service. There's no restriction on the kind of service that they can provide. So that might be something that could be useful. I know some of our projects will utilize RSVP volunteers to help with fundraising events, or they might have a special project or special time of year when they've got, um, you know, lots of food boxes to assemble or some, some sort of direct service activity where they can, they couldn't use the AmeriCorps VISTA members, but they could use RSVP volunteers. The second bullet on the slide uh, talks about the National Civilian Community Corps, which is often referred to as AmeriCorps NCCC, and this is one of the other AmeriCorps programs. AmeriCorps NCCC is a team of 
eight to 10 trained volunteers who serve full time for a period of one to six weeks. And they can assist with a specific project that might require a concentrated volunteer effort. Some examples of what NCCC teams can do, they can construct a new house or a new building. They can implement logistics for a wellness clinic. Say you've got a two day wellness clinic in your community. You could bring in an NCCC clinic to take care of all the logistics for you. Um, NCCC members are specifically trained to respond to disasters. So if you're, say, you have a building that was flooded during the disaster, or if your um, building happens to be a, uh, a shelter for people that have been affected by a disaster, then the NCCC can come in and staff that, that emergency shelter, or they can help clean up after the disaster. So they, again, they're trained, specifically trained in disaster response and running emergency shelters. Another possibility is uh, National Days of Service. Uh, many of our uh, volunteers that are enrolled in our other programs and AmeriCorps members are engaged in National Days of Service and they're, lo it's, they're often looking for half day or full day service opportunities to help out any, any community organizations. And some examples of activities that might take place on a National Day of Service would be assembling food boxes, delivering holiday gift bags, that kind of thing. So it's a, again, a, that's, that's an even shorter term opportunity, but sometimes that's what you need is somebody to come in and just, just take care of a big project where you just need many hands on deck for a short period of time. And then this last slide lists some other resources and um, Susan referred to these at the beginning of the call, some of the uh, resources that I sent um, to the diaper bank network. Uh, there's program guidance for the AmeriCorps VISTA program for each year. Uh, right now the 2015 AmeriCorps VISTA program guidance is in effect. We'll issue the 2016 program guidance uh, before the end of the year and that will be in effect for 2016. We have specific concept paper instructions that we can share with you. And both of these documents are also available on our website. Our website is nationalservice.gov. And I didn't provide all of the instructions for how to find the um, AmeriCorps VISTA section because sometimes the website gets redesigned and then I, I want to make sure that the information I'm giving you is, is still accurate. So it's best just to go to that home page and you can uh, just search for VISTA and find the information for VISTA projects. And the last resource listed on this slide is VISTA Campus. This is a website that provides a lot of uh, training and technical assistance resources, similar to what the Diaper Bank Network provides for all of you. So it's a website you can visit, you can find all kinds of resources for VISTA projects. VISTA members go to vistacampus.gov to find resources for their year of service, and there's other resources as well. So thank you for your time today. Um, it, could we open it up for questions now? I think I just unmuted everybody. So um, we're a pretty pretty yeah, small yeah, group. If you yeah, have yeah, any yeah. questions, okay. feel free to speak up. Um, go ahead and ask them. And you can also send them in the chat box or email them to me at susan at diaperbanknetwork.org. And I'll ask them for you. And one thing I did, I um, actually did get some comments from people who are not here, but there was the diaper bank in Columbus, Ohio, who um, was just wondering if information that you were going to make available. I know you said there's different timelines, and I had said originally that we could help people kind of, it seems like it's get in touch with the state <laughs> office. Would you say it's relatively uniform across the board? So if we're giving out information to the diaper banks, of course they want to check, but is it the same program like federally? Um, well, if, if you're talking specifically about the Ohio office uh, for uh -huh. the Corporation for National and Community Service, um, I would say it's best to contact them. They have quite a few AmeriCorps VISTA resources in the state of Ohio. They also run some national VISTA projects. So I, 
do not know what their timeline is. I know um, many of our field offices do issue a request for concept paper in the fall when we know what, our, what resources we will have available for the year, but they may do it on a different timeline. And okay. so, um, again, I think it's best to contact them. But in Ohio, they would definitely have those other resources that I listed earlier, the um, Retired and Senior Volunteer Program, the National Civilian Community Corps, and so those, you know, those other programs are available in all of our, uh, in all of our states. Okay, so start with the state information, but for the most part, start looking before fall if folks are interested. Uh, yes, I would say yes. And just, just to let people know, this is the busiest time of year for all of our field offices. We are currently placing all of our VISTAs in service. Many of the positions start in the summer months. So if somebody doesn't get back to you right away, it's really just because that person is frantically busy, probably until um, mid-July. So, you know, if you don't get an answer, please don't be discouraged. Try again and just know that we're all very, very busy and um, this time of year is just the, the, the peak of our workload. I wanted to ask another question, and um, so the diaper banks, our network is made of about 245 diaper banks, and they vary greatly in terms of size and how well they're developed. We have some large organizations who are also sort of spearheading diaper banks in their communities, and then the other extreme would be an individual person who sees the need in his or her community and then decides to start collecting diapers and starts very small, collecting diapers, operating out of her home, recruiting a couple volunteers, working solely from donations, and I'm wondering if you have any suggestions about what would be, what would, do you think would be the minimum requirements for an organization? Um, obviously, you know, 501c3 and like you said, office space, but can you talk a little bit about what, what the minimum, what minimum standards kind of need to be in place for an organization to be ready to work with a VISTA? Sure. Um, I like to see an organization that has at least three or four staff. It's, it's very difficult to place a VISTA with an organization that's one person, especially if that person is a volunteer and doesn't even get paid. Um, that, that means that person is, is far too busy to provide appropriate supervision and oversight for an AmeriCorps VISTA member. So at the minimum, they should have three to four staff. Um, I do always look at an organization's tax filings, so they're 990, and if there is no 990 on record, then I might question why is there no, no, no 990, and, um, and, and that may lead to other information that, that could indicate that organization is not ready for a VISTA at this time. So I don't okay. know if that answered your question fully or no, not. That, <laughs> okay. that does. Those, both of those things I think are really useful kind of checkpoints for mm -hmm. a lot of our members to sort of either say, no, I'm definitely not ready, or I'm not sure, hearing that and saying, okay, no, we're not ready, or mm -hmm. yeah, okay, we have those. So at least they would know that this is something viable. Do you have any thoughts about um, common mistakes that people make in the, in the concept paper phase? Uh, yes, not following the instructions. <laughs> I actually have seen answer. that a number of times. Somebody will they they think they they know they can make a need statement and they um you know they they start preparing the concept paper without referring back to the instructions because the instructions actually are very specific about what is to be included in that need statement. It's not just writing a generic need statement that would fit into any application, but it's, you need to address the specific questions in the concept paper instructions. So it's very important to read the instructions and to follow the instructions and to, um, you know, that, that's, that's, I'd say that, that is, that's a very common mistake. Okay. 
As far as the, the multi-site, can you expand a little bit on the uh, multi-site aspect of the program? We have, we have a few areas throughout the country where some small diaper banks have developed independently and are now starting to work together. And the other, the other factor that I'm wondering that may tie in is because the diaper banks are working so hard to sometimes lead and establish a grassroots anti-poverty coalition. So I'm wondering if, if that might be something that is going to be, you know, a common, a common factor for diaper banks, that multi-site mm -hmm. aspect and how, how that works. Yeah, multi-site is actually a great, I think that's a great way to go, a multi-site VISTA project. Um, it's many of our field offices, at least in, in this part of the country, have moved toward a model of only multi-site VISTA projects. Part of it is a, um, just a management of our, of our workload issue. If we have, you know, 50 VISTA projects with one VISTA each, it's a lot more work than if we have five VISTA projects with 10 VISTAs each, for example. So it really helps um, the field office kind of uh, bring those resources together. Another huge advantage, I think, to a multi-site VISTA project is that instead of an AmeriCorps VISTA member off working with one organization and kind of by themselves working with that one organization, VISTAs that are part of a multi-site project are part of a team of other VISTA members that are doing similar activities. In New Haven, for example, we have a wonderful VISTA project that's focused on educational outcomes for the students in the New Haven schools. There's 22 VISTAs serving. They serve with many organizations, about at least 10 different organizations. And those VISTAs come together for trainings, they come together for service projects, they come together just for social occasions, they share um, ideas on how they can do their service activities more effectively. They are able to share their, their accomplishments with one another. They're able to share tips on how to, how to live off that tiny little living allowance. So yeah, it, it like really provides this, this resource of, among VISTAs and it, it strengthens the project because they're sharing that information. Yeah, I would think that that would be very useful. Yeah, and the other, I think the other advantage for the, from the project standpoint is that um, a project could have a goal of, you know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'll just use an example from a different project because I'm not coming up in my mind right now with a great goal for a diaper bank project. But um, for example, this VISTA project in New Haven, Connecticut, that works with educational outcomes, they have a goal to reach a certain number of students in any given year. But because, because they have so many sites, they're able to say, we think we're going to reach 1,700 students this year. And you know, I'm just pulling that number out of a hat, but that is an example. So if, so each of the sites might reach a portion of that total, but as a, as a whole, the project as a whole can reach that target of 1,700. So it strengthens the project's outcomes if they can have more than one site at the project. So if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And I'm wondering, so I, as I'm listening, I'm wondering uh, kind of the flip side of that, which is um, one area where we still are sort of working to identify people that um, that we can help start diaper banks and increase their capacity is in rural areas. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you, Connecticut doesn't really have too much in terms of, you know, large rural areas, but mm -hmm. is that something that becomes an added challenge? for, a, you know, if there's a diaper bank in an Appalachian area or somewhere where there might not be that um, access to, to that network. Because I do, I think that the, the idea of regional VISTAs working together could probably really benefit not just the diaper bank, but the, but the anti-poverty community overall. And I'm just wondering how that works in, a, in more rural regions, if you know. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The the rural, um, I, I know it is it is one of the programming priorities year after year of AmeriCorps VISTA on a national level to place more VISTAs in rural areas because we do have very underserved rural areas in many parts of our country. Probably not so much in Connecticut, but in other states that have, you know, you, you mentioned Appalachia, for example, um, you know, some of our western states have a lot, have, have large expanses of what what are clearly rural areas so definitely that's that's something that we're interested in seeing is applications from organizations that are serving rural areas um, we do have examples in those rural areas of multi-site VISTA projects that even if they can't get together on a regular basis to meet face-to-face, -face, they can do video conferences or, or Skype, and um, there's, there's ways to bring that network together even if the people aren't face-to-face. -face. So that's, that's so, certainly a great, um, you know, a, a great opportunity to develop a project in a rural area, and it's, it's certainly a priority area for us as well. Okay, so when you say priority area, um, my last question was actually about that target percentage that you gave and the cost share, and if you could just sort of reiterate mm -hmm. how that works. So, and if, if a rural area was a target area, then um, there would be some more sort of wiggle room for, for an, appli an applicant organization that might not have the resources Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The cost share is just, it's, it's an opportunity. We encourage our VISTA project sponsors to, to participate in the cost share, but it's also, um, it's a reality that many of our sponsors cannot do that. So some of our states will take a look at their project sponsors and they might select one or two that are the most, you know, that have, have the greatest number of resources and are able to, to take on that cost share to support uh, the the project and by, you know, reimbursing the Corporation for National and Community Service for the living allowance for one or more of the VISTAs. So um, in those, in, in a state with a large rural area, then I would anticipate that those those field offices would take a look at to see which of our project sponsors can afford to do this cost share and which cannot, and then they would they would place the burden of the cost share on those on those sponsors that can afford it, so that that would not eliminate the you know the it it would not have any negative impact on the more rural smaller you know smaller scale project sponsors. Great. Does anybody have any questions? I know I I have my list here and I kind of took over. Okay, well, Anne, um, I'm also, my last question is, the diaper banks that are seriously interested in um, pursuing a VISTA and are trying to drum up support in their area and out talking to their donors um, and their supporters and their community partners, what do you think is the, the best pitch and the advantage to sort of get people on board and excited and, you know, leveraging that excitement to really kind of back and support the diaper bank to bring in a VISTA. So you're, you're asking what, how do they drum up support in the local community to, to get the resources? What is it about the VISTA program that might get mm -hmm. supporters excited about additionally oh. supporting the diaper bank? I mean, I think it's exciting that, you know, a new person is coming in and bringing a skill set, but I'm wondering mm -hmm. in the past what people have sort of said about the VISTA program. Well, I, yeah, I think VISTA can, can be a real shot in the arm for an organization. It can really help rejuvenate an organization. It can, a VISTA member or, or two can, can help bring new, new excitement, new blood, you know, new energy to an organization. They come in with new ideas. Many of our VISTA members are college graduates. That's not a requirement, but many are because in order to do the capacity building work that VISTA's, uh, that is required of VISTA, it typically requires somebody with a little bit of, um, you know, education or life skills. We do have some folks that come into VISTA, they may not have a college degree, but they have experience, you know, run, either running a nonprofit or working for a nonprofit, or maybe even they're coming from the private uh, for-profit sector. So there are people that come to you with, with resources, with skills, with experience, and so, um, and 
I find many of our organizations, they, they will tell me after the VISTA has served, they said, wow, we had no idea that this, this young woman that came to serve with our organization for a year, or this young man or this older person that came to serve with us for a year could do so much in such a short period of time. I know VISTA members are incredibly motivated and they're, they have 12 months and that's not a lot of time. And so they want to get things done. They want to come in and they want to make a difference in that 12 month period. They, again, they come in with new ideas and uh, new approaches. So an organization might kind of be doing things the same old way and a VISTA could come in and say, wait a minute, have you ever thought about this? And it really can help rejuvenate and regenerate and, and bring excitement and new ideas and new energy and, and lead to, uh, you know, to some great things. So, yeah, VISTA can really be an a extremely valuable and important resource that can just change an organization and how it operates. Great. Thank you so much, Anne. I think I'm really excited about it. I think that a lot of our diaper banks are going to um, pursue it. It seems like it's a really wonderful match, the diaper banks and the VISTA program, and I appreciate your taking the time to explain it to us. I'll be um, sending out the link for the webinar recording and also the resources, um, and we'll be following up. If anybody has any questions, we can help follow up with that. But thank you so much, Anne, for sharing your information. You're welcome. Have a great day. Thanks, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.